Hey everyone, Andrew Sims at the New York premiere of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. A lot of stars showing up today. We have Mike Tannenbaum on camera and a lot of great interviews coming up for you guys. How did you decide for this one what stays and what, what, what was pulled out? It's a really good question because it was a really hard thing for me. Um, as you know, all the previous books I adapted, I did in one movie. So instantly, you, you certain decisions are honestly made for you. I mean, you know you can't have this, you can't have this. On this, instead of having two and a half hours of screen time, I had five hours of screen time. And I thought, this is going to be fantastic. This is going to be easy. And suddenly I opened the book and I go, wait a minute, the decisions aren't made for me anymore. I've got to actually kind of figure this out a little bit. And, I mean, I'm being slightly facetious, but not really. It was very hard when I started Hallows to, to kind of find the rhythm of the choices and what to emphasize, what to lose. I found that rhythm. But, but initially it was a little bit kind of tough sledding um, because of what I said, you know, what I was talking about. Um, I, I think that I just think in a very cynical age, what Joe has done is that she presents things like loyalty and courage and friendship and honor in a way that's completely unsaccharine. And I think so. The world, the world hungers for those things. They just don't want them to be presented in this cloying, saccharine way. They want them to be presented earnestly but real. And she does that. And I, I, I think we've been able to do that too. And I give most of the credit to that to you know, Emma, Rupert, and Dan. I just think you, know, you, you feel it's real. You once joked to uh, David Heyman, he said that you had so much material, you could make three films. So, no question. If, no question. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's my feeling. I mean, because, because I, love, I love this book. I love the story. I love... You know, I love the, I, look, I, I just think Joe's world is so rich um, that I, I really, I mean, there'll be some people that shudder at me saying that, but I think, I think it could have been three movies, personally. Well, I, I'm sure a lot of fans would appreciate that, so thank you. Thank you. So with Half-Blood Prince, um, Warner Brothers asked you, I think it was, to change the color slightly in the film. It was a little too green. So, too brown, actually. Too brown. Yeah, it was too brown. Was there anything like that that they asked you to change for uh, when they saw it? Was there anything they wanted you to change for this film? No, they loved this film. I mean, they loved, they loved, they loved excuse me, they loved Half Blood Prince, but um, uh, it was just we it, it, it developed too strong a look as we played with the grading, uh, and they were right. You know, and in fact, uh, Bruno Delvinol was subsequently nominated for an Academy Award uh, for once he'd gone back and changed the grade. But no, they loved this film from beginning to end, and um, they were very happy and didn't ask us to change anything. How about anything from uh, J.K. Rowling? Does she have any uh, suggestions for you? Advice? Uh, well, she saw, the, she saw the film quite late on. Obviously, we speak to her uh, throughout the filmmaking process, uh, and she reads the script and offers advice um, during the development stage. Um, uh, but she, she was very, very happy with the film. She loves this film. So, yeah, great. What reaction do you expect to get from the viewers here in the United States? Well, fingers crossed. Um, you know, we're, we're, we never take it for granted, but we hope they'll like the film. You know, we, what we set out to do every time is to try and make something that's a proper representation of the, the book, a visual rep representation of the book. Uh, and we then have to satisfy Joe. Um, and when she sees it, and then we obviously have to satisfy the fans. If it, if it passes muster with Joe, uh, then we're hopeful. We become slightly more relaxed that it'll work with the fans too. But uh, fingers crossed, you can never tell. Are you hoping to bring this movie into Latin America where most of our viewers are? Yeah, no, we'd love to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we recently learned that Leaves and Studios is going to be. It was purchased by Warner, and now they're going to they're going to create a Harry Potter museum. So, what are the, some of the things that fans can expect to find there? Uh, it's, it's not not by well, his kind of a museum. It's they call it an exhibit, the Harry Potter exhibit, uh, and it's, it's going to be lots of original artifacts, both uh, you know from uh, the, the um, set construction side and costumes, props. I think there'll be lots of things that are actually that have appeared in the films that people have seen on the screen and they'll be able to see detailed, in fact, that they've not seen, uh, you know, with something that's been seen in passing on the screen. Uh, they can stop and have a proper look and actually see detail that um, I think they'll find really interesting that they've just not been able to see before. Awesome. Do you know when that's going to open yet? Do you have a... I believe it's uh, about two years' time, between 18 months and two years' time. Because they've just started construction work, so it's underway. Awesome. Can't wait. Thank you very much, David. Nice to meet you. Nice. At the junket, we heard that, uh, well, Ron, or sorry, Rupert and Emma yeah. said that you guys may be doing reshoots for the epilogue. Yeah, we might. I looked at it last week. 
I haven't shown anyone yet. I haven't shown the producers. I haven't shown the studio. Um, but I think we might pick it up. I'm not sure yet. I'm going to do another edit on it, which is what we normally do. You know, if it's, something's not quite cooking, you rework it, rework it, rework it. But if we pick it up, we'll do it in December. You said something about it, to draw it out more, to make it... No, we won't draw it out anymore. No, we'll... Um... No, there were just a few things. Because it's right at the end of the movie, you want it to be perfect, you know, so... It's one that's, of those things. It's great that you're putting in that extra thought. Oh, we always do. And uh, I watched the film, got to the end. There's some really smashing things in the film. And then you get to the end and you want to go, you want to be lifted up. And uh, I wasn't quite lifted up. So we might pick it up. One other question. What uh, deleted scenes can fans expect to see on the DVD? They always look forward to them. Oh, some great scenes. Rupert and Emma throwing stones in a lock. It was totally improvised. They're very, very funny. And it's Hermione trying to get Ron to be tactile with him and to get close to her. He's trying to, she's trying to manipulate him to sort of be tactile with her, basically. It's a really charming, funny scene. Uh, lovely scene between Petunia and Harry at Little Whinging, which is very, very strong. And a really fun scene with Harry and Ron hunting in the forest, trying to get food for the table. They're trying to kill a rabbit with their wands. And they're running through the forest, and, and it gets a bit intense, and, and Ron nearly hits Harry with the wand, nearly kills him. Not kills him, but it's a really interesting scene. You are one of the hardest workers in the franchise, and on behalf of the fans, we want to say thanks so much. You put in a lot of work, so thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thanks, David.